There's a vital element that affects how we move through our lives. Data. It's the lifeblood of our connected world, and it's growing every day. It powers the Internet of Things, but it's much more. It's there in life's sweet moments. When we need to make crucial decisions, it's there. Saving essential seconds with the right information. It helps us learn and play. Deliver the essentials of life and buy the things we desire. When we need to make better decisions or forecast the future, it's there. When we want to create new things, build a better world, go new places, or just save our memories, it's there, making our lives better, connecting us, protecting us, enabling us to do great things. HGST, helping the world harness the power of data. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to HGST's Press and Industry Analyst Briefing. I'm Judy Fuji Wong, and I head up Corporate Marketing and Communications. I want to thank everyone for coming in today from near and far, as well as those of you who have joined us via the live stream. We're really pleased to have you here to share some exciting news about HGST. But before we get started, I'd like to call your attention to our safe harbor slide regarding any forward-looking statements that might be made today during the presentation or during the Q&A. For a more detailed summary, please see our SEC filing regarding any risks associated with our business. Also want to reference our website, hgst.com, for any capacity and trademark statements. Now, immediately following today's keynote, We'll be addressing audience questions. And for those of you that are in the room, please just flag down someone with a microphone. And for those of you that have joined us via the live stream, as well as those of you that are in the room, you may also text us at 22333 with the keyword HGST in the body, uh, followed by your question. You can also submit questions via pollev.com slash HGST. With that, I'd like to kick off today's event with the theme, hashtag long live data, and introduce to you President and CEO of Western Digital Corporation, Steve Milligan. So good morning. Um, I actually have the easiest uh, job in terms of the, uh, the presentation today. Um, so there's just a few things that I want to do. One. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody here. Thank you for coming. Um, we appreciate your interest in our company and what we're about to talk about. Um, I'd also like to welcome those that have joined us uh, over the internet um, here in San Francisco. Uh, we also appreciate your attention and, uh, and interest in our company. Um, the purpose of today's event is for uh, our HGST subsidiary, the HGST subsidiary of Western Digital, to share its vision, uh, its strategy, um, and innovations in terms of what we're doing in the marketplace. Uh, it's actually a very interesting time in terms of what we're dealing with. Uh, as you can tell from the hashtag, clearly this is all about data. And as a leading company in the storage industry, um, data is clearly uh, our friend. Um, our primary mission as a company is actually fairly simple in the sense that what we're trying to do is help our customers and help our partners extract as much value as we can, um, add as much value in this uh, data-centric world. So the way that data is created, the way that it is preserved, um, and most of you obviously know this, is influenced or driven by a lot of different things. Um, one of the key themes today that I think is very important is that I've been in the, and I sort of hate to admit this in the sense, you know, from an age standpoint, but I've been in the IT industry for quite a while. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the amount of change, the amount of disruption that we're dealing with from an industry perspective may very well be uh, more significant than at any time that we've seen. Um, and so when we look at things in terms of the ecosystem, who does what, how they do it, 
what technology they use, and equally important is how they monetize that or how they charge for it. Um, so the amount of disruption and change in the industry is quite significant. Um, so when you look at that, it's easy to think to yourself that um, you have to make a choice or that we're at a point of inflection or I think a better way of putting it that there may be a right or wrong way or a right technology or a wrong technology. Um, we actually take a different view at Western Digital, a slightly different perspective on that in regards to the fact that with all of this change that's going on, uh, it's creating a uh, diversity of opportunity or diverse set of needs from a industry perspective or from a storage perspective. And the good thing from our perspective is that that actually creates more opportunities for us. Um, and so part of the purpose of this session today is to, one, talk about what we're seeing from an industry perspective, uh, talk about what we're doing to help our customers and our partners to extract value from that data-centric world, um, and talk about what opportunities that means for Western Digital. Um, we're very excited about what's happening from an industry perspective. We're excited about what's happening from a company perspective. Uh, and we hope that you uh, leave today equally as excited as we are. So with that, I will uh, now turn it over to my good friend, Mike Cordano, the president of HGST. Great. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Well, I want to extend my welcome to those of you in the room and those of you on the web. Um, I'm here today to share uh, HGSC's thoughts about and our plan to transform the data center. Data, we love to create, share, refine, and transform it. The funny thing about it is that unlike most things, data's value increases over time. Data is increasingly the currency of the new economy. As the industry fully transitions to the third platform of computing, the world's becoming more data-centric. Our ability to harness the true power of data creates massive opportunities for us all. We can make better, more confident decisions. We can adapt to change as it happens. And we can even predict the future. All around us, the ecosystem is transforming with a greater focus on how data is stored, accessed, and protected. HGST is uniquely positioned to drive innovation and to lead the transformation of the data center. Our commitment to innovation, quality, and reliability has earned customers trust. And that trust goes back over 50 years. Our heritage of innovation goes back to the invention of the hard disk drive. Over time, we've been a prolific innovator with over 7,000 active patents, and we've continually innovated HDD technologies with consistent focus on quality and reliability. As times move on, we've evolved with and enabled the evolution of the industry, again with a focus on performance, reliability, and value creation. An example of that is the solid state disk drive market. We realized early on the need to boost application performance with low latency storage technologies. And we were an early mover through our joint development agreement with Intel dating back to 2008 of entering this new emerging market. A short time later, we became the leader in the enterprise SaaS SSD market. As time has continued to progress, our innovations continue to be key enablers in serving the new demands of cloud data centers. Going forward, we will continue to accelerate our innovation and drive the transformation of the data center ecosystem while we transform HGST. Data growth, everybody's talking about it. In fact, we expect that to grow 10x between the years 2013 and 2020. The volume, velocity, and variety are creating immense challenges. You have to ask yourself questions like how much of this data is really useful and what's it worth to keep it. In fact, studies show that data-driven decisions make businesses more productive and more profitable. How much data do we need to achieve that benefit? Will more data really make us more productive and profitable? 
What about all the devices that are generating more and more data? Where do we put the data? And how will we get at it? Growth in data is fostering new uses for it. The value brought by exp expanding uses brings new opportunities throughout the ecosystem. To extract value from raw data, it needs to be transformed. From data to information, from information to knowledge, and from knowledge to wisdom. Organization want, organizations want tools and applications to help them to make better decisions, adapt to change, and predict the future. And to accomplish this in a world of exponential growth, the infrastructure providers need to make quantum leaps in efficiency so we don't suffer exponential growth in expenses, accessibility so data can be quickly and easily accessed, and longevity to preserve it and keep data for long periods of time. The way data is stored and tr transformed is also changing. We've been hearing for years about the power of the cloud and the evolution of the cloud. In fact, this year, 2014, some analysts are predicting the crossover point where the workloads that are in cloud data centers will surpass the workloads uh, in traditional data centers. Cloud infrastructures focus on a multi, uh, have a multi-user nature and have massive scale, which requires us to have a sharp focus on flexibility, scalability, and ultra-low ultra TCO as we develop solutions. Cloud providers are also focused on a reliable infrastructure that's easy to manage so they can spend more of their time and resource creating new services and attracting new customers. Up to this point, I've talked about three underlying themes. First one being the performance demands by new applications. The second being the math massive growth of data. And the third being the predominance of the cloud and influencing and driving new infrastructure requirements. Storage creates the foundation for enabling data transformation. In short, storage enables the world to realize the value of data. With that in mind, we'll be making several announcements. New devices that raise the bar for high density building blocks for storing data. An industry first solution that provides uncompromised application acceleration, and an entry into the emerging opportunity with a revolutionary solution for data storage scalability. Our innovations can be thought of in two broad categories. First, a capacity-centric innovation that allows us to store data and enable more accurate decisions. And the second, a performance-centric innovation that enables faster and even real-time decisions. Let's start with the capacity-centric block innovations. Leveraging our heritage as a leader in enterprise and data storage devices, today we're announcing the Ultrastar 7K6000. This is our seventh generation in our line of capacity enterprise drives, and it's the only drive to deliver six terabytes at 1.2 terabytes per platter and offering the high reliability of 2 million hours MTBF that has become the trademark of HGST. I'll also note that this is our last in-air product. It's the feeling, our feeling, that to continue to maintain and deliver the reliability that enterprises and cloud data centers require, all future capacity enterprise offerings from HGST will be based on our Helium platform. Speaking of that platform, two years ago we announced our Helium platform, HelioSeal. A year later we announced our six terabyte HE6 drive, and since then we've shipped hundreds of thousands of these into the field to dozens of customers. That has allowed us to fully prove the platform from a manufacturability and reliability standpoint, as well as validate the value proposition. Following in the footsteps of the HE6 product, today we're announcing the Ultrastar HE, HE8, an eight terabyte helium filled and sealed drive. This is our second generation helio seal design, and it uses traditional PMR recording to provide an efficient blend of capacity and performance. There are no compromises with the Ultrastar HE8. 
It seamlessly fits within existing infrastructure with no updating, and it continues to deliver on low TCO, low power, high density, and cooler operation. Now let's hear what a customer has to say about this platform. The servers we built for the Netflix Open Connect platform are very specialized appliances and they really only have one task which is to get movie and television content from the storage infrastructure, the spinning drives, onto the network. Typical server deployments have 36 drives and by using Helo Seal drives that enables us to save a significant amount of power. The total system power is more than half is associated directly with the hard drives, so any savings we see in uh, per hard drive power utilization directly results in a lower power system, and the lower the power of the system, the more infrastructure we can fit in rack infrastructure that's limited by power. And even going beyond what we've been able to do to date with a traditional enterprise, a capacity enterprise drive, our R&D teams continue to build an impressive portfolio of innovative technologies. And today we're bringing together two of those, our helium-filled technology and combining it with shingled magnetic recording to deliver the world's highest capacity, most power and space efficient disk drive. Today we're announcing a 10 terabyte sealed HDD, the world's first 10 terabyte enterprise class HDD. By combining the HEAL platform with a shingle magnetic recording, we're able to deliver unprecedented capacity. Its high capacity and ultra low cost TCO makes an ideal building block for new applications to underpin cool to cold storage and applications such as active archiving. And by the way, this is not a future announcement. We're actually sampling this product now. This drive is purpose built for a new application set for data that's past its create and modifies phase of life. And it's more targeted at efficient and accessible long term retention. It takes TCO and storage density to new levels and enables new capacity storage applications and solutions. Taking a look at the mark, traditional market segmentation within the capacity segment, it's really been broken historically into two basic categories. First, warm online storage. The second, offline archival storage. We see an opportunity to create a new category of active archive disk-based storage by addressing the specific efficiency and ex accessibility needs of this use case. The 10 terabyte sealed HDD is the first step in unlocking the value of data by allowing, by allowing this application to take place in data centers around the world. To summarize today's announcements, first we announced an in-air, six terabyte traditional enterprise workload extension to our capacity enterprise Ultrastar line. Then two new drives based upon our Helio Seal technology. The first, an eight terabyte drive based on PMR technology that seamlessly works within existing infrastructure. And then last, a 10 terabyte drive combining the new technology, technology foundation of shingle magnetic recording to unlock and enable new application use cases. Now, let's turn our attention to faster decisions with performance-centric innovations. For some time, we've been working with the world's largest server OEMs and cloud service providers on focusing on ways to accelerate applications. The key to supercharging these applica applications is the ability to bring data closer to the compute power that's running those applications. We've had a front row seat to this evolving architecture through our entry into the market through, with our in enterprise SaaS SSD and through that, we've learned we needed to do a few things. We need to expand our product portfolio to include a PCI offering, and we needed to acquire more capabilities to add value on top of that. Uh, and we demonstrated that commitment to enter and to provide that value through three acquisitions last year. The Velibit acquisition, the Aztec acquisition, and the Viridin acquisition. 
bringing us key capabilities in the case of Velibit, of, of application acceleration and dedupe technology, STEC giving us a broad portfolio of products and controller technology, and Virident that's allowing us to share and perform uh, clustering solutions as we move forward. So to talk more about our Flash platform strategy and plans, I'm going to ask Mike Gustafson, Gus, to join me and take it out. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate that. Well, good morning. I think we all know that Flash technology is transforming the data center today. Uh, in fact, over 50% of enterprises today have deployed Flash in some form or another. We have a vision that is much more aggressive than that. Uh, we see Flash as a more pervasive technology and one that we can actually solve not only problems around a particular application acceleration, but also delivering Flash as a platform where we can actually create a new tier of storage with the highest possible performance at the lowest possible latencies. And as a thought leader in the industry, we are very excited to share our view of where we're headed with this in terms of not only enabling and delivering, but helping accelerate and shape the market in terms of how we actually make this a reality. So let me start with this. Everybody knows that Flash is all about speed. It, it's all about speed. Application acceleration, uh, we know that, we get the benefits of that. But it's also about intelligence. We have got to bring the capabilities of not only that speed, but that intelligence. And by pulling those two things together, we can actually begin to transform not only the applications, but we can also start to transform business models, being able to offer new products, new services that weren't possible before. And if you take it to the next step, we can actually drive data center transformation, not only in terms of technology and architecture, but actually in terms of helping change the world. Now, this can happen in terms of deeper insights around high performance data. We can actually provide you know, faster response times, whether that's your social media site or you're looking for the best hotel or plane flight, et cetera. But it also allows us to move from a real time decision making to actually begin to predict things and, and go forward, thinking about correlating things. And I'll share some examples of that as we go forward as well. Correlation, deeper insights on that analytics and then actually making and forming relationships. A uh, great example of that is some of the work we do with LinkedIn, which I'll talk about later. Now we're going to talk about three primary areas today. We're going to talk about our device and portfolio leadership and what we're doing to continue to extend that. We're going to talk about a concept around what we call device affinity. A critical part of our differentiation is bringing to the market the combination of our core IP on the hardware side and our core IP and insights on the software side. And there are multiple layers as we move up the stack to continue to innovate and provide more intelligence around. By linking these layers together more tightly in a handshake, we can actually provide levels of performance and endurance that are beyond any competitors and start to be a more insightful and intelligent platform as we go forward. And then the third area we're going to talk about is continuing to move up the stack with the potential of bringing software and solutions driven capabilities to the market. Again, all wrapped around the disruptive or opportunistic technology of flash and solid state storage. Now we've been busy. As Mike mentioned, we've acquired three different companies in the last year. We've successfully integrated all three of those companies and actually integrated not only the roadmaps but delivered many elements of new products and technologies. I believe bringing together some of the world's greatest talent around Flash, not only on the technical side, but also on business model, sales and services, et cetera. And I am very pleased to be part of HGST, where the power of those three things combined have allowed us to do a couple of unique things. Number one, we've been able to expand the addressable market for the company with a leadership position in the enterprise SaaS world, which Mike mentioned, but also expanding into the PCIe and participation in SATA as well. And I think as important is that intelligence and device affinity that I talked about earlier, driving towards this vision of what I'll share in a minute, a flash fabric, continuing to move up the stack with advanced software and solutions capabilities. The second thing, and maybe more important, particularly for Steve and team here from Western Digital Corporation, is we're delivering. As part of the uh, decision around the acquisition, we committed to grow at or faster than the market. And you can see from our results, these are published as part of Western Digital's results, our fiscal year 14, which ended June 30, we actually drove growth greater than the market at 43% year over year growth. That is a direct contribution of breadth of expanding the market, access and new insights to customers, and then delivering on the revenue growth. 
So let me step back and share a very important element of what we see here. If we look back about a decade ago, we saw storage, which was tightly tied to an application deployed with a, a particular set of compute and directly connected into the storage, direct attached storage. And we knew that that had the highest levels of control, but we started to see some efficiency challenges. And so we created shared networks, storage area networks or network attached storage. And, and that capability allowed us to drive better utilization and better, and better management and centralized protection, but it came with a tremendous amount of software and intelligence to protect and to manage and to scale. Those same opportunities, or I'll say it differently, those same requirements are needed for Flash to become a platform. Our vision is that this is going to be the beginning of a Flash fabric, where regardless of where in the data center you choose to deploy Flash technology, you want the connective tissue of being able to leverage that, whether it's at the array side, an all flash array, a hybrid array, or even all the way up inside the server with the highest levels of proximity to that application. So in order to do that, we have to start with the end in mind. We have to start smart. We have to design and architect the combination of device leadership, device affinity, and advanced software and solutions so that we don't get caught into the constraints, but that we blast through those opportunities to start to enable this. And today's a big part of those announcements. So let me go into another element that's really critical. We, we have been at this for a while, as Mike mentioned, since 2008 with the relationship with Intel. But I think one of the things that we bring, and, and frankly, it's the benefit of leadership in terms of business results, but sometimes not spoken about as often are the pain points or the lessons learned or the scar tissue around different things that we've learned. But we know that we have to have deep insight around not only the controller, and the firmware and the advanced capabilities that enterprises expect with this technology. But we also have to have deep partnerships on the NAND side, and we have to bring capabilities to extend the life or the endurance of Flash as a technology. And we do that through things like cell care. These are cornerstone capabilities of our company. And again, these come from the aggregate investments and acquisitions that the company has made. We can't stop there, and you can't jump to the last step in this and jump to the party without having built it all the way up through. So we'll call this the compound impact of leadership. Experience and leadership at that cornerstone with the compound impact of adding device and portfolio leadership. Again, through experiences across our largest OEMs, the largest cloud users, and a growing number of direct enterprise customers that we've learned and evolved our technologies with. And device affinity is core to that. The next step in terms of compound impact is the advanced software and solution capability. Better understanding all the way up to the application and the business problem, what are we trying to solve for? What specific unique requirements does that application have? And how do we more tightly link that into that whole stack? And then finally, pulling all of that together to bring to market, whether through our largest partners on the OEM side, cloud, or directly as HGST reference architectures and solutions. Now we're going to focus today in the three highlighted areas in terms of some, some specific announcements that we're going to make. And I'm excited to start with a, a partnership announcement. Today we're announcing the extension of our Intel Joint Development Agreement. We have enjoyed this relationship since 2008, as Mike mentioned. It allows us and we have earned the right in the market to be the number one enterprise SaaS player. With this, we bring the best in class capabilities from HGST, our core our core competency around enterprise class storage, not just on the technology front, but also on how we pre and post sale support and our reliability and the expectations that people have grown to expect from our brand. Intel clearly brings a level of depth and insight on the NAND side. When we put these two things together, not only are we driving current leadership in the market, but we're very excited about where we're headed with next generations of this technology. Now, as I mentioned, we've been busy. I just want to highlight some recent announcement. There are, over the last 45 days, before I share what we're also going to announce today, we've announced some other recent elements here. This is the UltraStar Enterprise SaaS product that was announced with Intel. This is in qualification today. Very pleased with the uptake and the momentum of qualifications that are occurring in the marketplace around this product. We also announced extensions to our PCIe product set with a Flash Max 3. This platform and product has joined the industry's highest density Flash Max 2, which is a 4.8 terabyte offering on a half height card. We announced software capabilities, leveraging those acquisitions again 
with a server cache offering which provides up to eight times the performance in a Microsoft SQL environment. And then finally, we also have not rested on current products. We've been working very aggressively to make sure that we're looking out across the horizon on what next technologies are there. And we actually demonstrated a technology with Micron at the recent Flash Memory Summit, which involved phase change memory and some unique access and usage patterns where we together opened up and showed benefits as much as 3 million IOPS. So again, I think what you see is we've been busy integrating, we've been busy delivering, and now let me take you to the next step of some additional announcements today. So one of the benefits of performance on Flash is getting obviously inside the server as close as possible. And we do that today with PCIe technology. One of the opportunities is to continue, and, and, and part of that today is a proprietary approach to how you actually solve for uh, host and, and performance and application behaviors. We continue to drive advantage there, but there's also an evolution in the market that we've been supporting, driving, and participating in, again, to help shape where the market is headed, and that is around the standardization of what we call the NVMe or the non-volatile memory express. So that will bring to the market a simpler deployment because of the standards. It should also drive, because of that simpler deployment, a lower TCO capability for our customers and for the market. Today we're very pleased to announce that we are entering that market with our first NVMe platform. This is the Ultrastar SN100 in capacity points of 1.6 and 3.2 terabyte offerings. Again, with choice and form factor with an add-in card, half height, as well as a two and a half inch drive form factor. An exciting first industry first is the highest density in a two and a half inch drive, 3.2 terabyte offering. Again, an industry first in the NVMe space. And an important element of this product and platform is our deep partnership with Toshiba. Here we've selected Toshiba's MLC NAND to help us drive not only a lower cost point, but by combining that with our internal technology that we call cell care, we can actually drive behavior and endurance of the flash longer. So that example, by the way, of cell care is a great example of what we call this device affinity. And just to hit the point again, device affinity for us is taking advantage of all of the, the, the insights that we have. It's almost like getting the playbook of your competitor or the cookbook with all the special secret ingredients that you know, grandma might have, might have had and if, if your favorite food or memory with your family. And by doing that and actually connecting those things together, we can drive performance and endurance benefits of up to two times. I, mean, you, I talked about cell care. Let me give you a, a, another example. In a software-only cache environment, we actually write twice. We do writes twice, once to the cache index itself and once for the actual data. Well, in this environment, with the benefit of device affinity, we can actually capture and keep that information inside the cache index, and we only write it once. So that gives us an immediate 50% benefit in terms of reduced writes. Let's carry that forward. Based on the performance of flash technology, by minimizing the writes, we also extend the life. So you can see in that example how device affinity drives advantage. Let me give you another one, a second example. In the area of mirroring, which is a technology that we announced a little over a year ago on the advanced software side, we have the ability to provide replication across different applications. Again, where the flash provides that direct linkage, the replication is done between two flash devices. And in that case, you can actually replicate or mirror or recover at the speed of flash. And again, that's an element of tight integration between the hardware and the software. We don't expect to sit there, we expect to continue to drive leadership, both in our own unique advantages that make sense for our company, but also we expect to continue to drive standards and we're fully supportive of the API extensions that are occurring in NVMe, participating in that, and we'll continue to contribute there as well. So now I'm gonna step back to the third uh, critical announcement and I wanna revisit this concept of a flash fabric. So again, for, for those of us that were there, we remember the benefits of the highest possible performance and complete control over the stack, right? The application, the compute, and the storage. And we got huge benefits. But we weren't as efficient as we needed to be because what we found is we had to add the storage to every single server, or in this case, every single storage array. We can come at this in a new way. We can come at this in a way where we can actually deliver the at-scale flash fabric 
and we can look at, instead of the challenges of either over-provisioning and under-utilizing that storage, we can actually create a shared platform to not only benefit a single application, but mixed workloads across multiple applications without compromise of that performance. So how do we get there? We get there with the architecture that started from the beginning. And there is a complete and broad scope of software differentiation. I'm gonna walk around this clock a little bit with you. Let's start with the device management. Simpler to deploy, simpler to manage, device management across our entire portfolio. In addition, we've provided a profiler uh, capability. This profiler capability allows us to understand the behaviors of Flash and maybe different environments and actually make recommendations. And those recommendations may be made on our hardware or anyone else's third-party hardware. So this is a tool to help customers understand the what if. What if I deployed Flash in a caching capability? What if I deployed in this environment? As we continue to wrap around, we've talked about our single server cache. We also announced a clustered version, a scale out version of cache, which provides coherency across scale out. And now let's take the next steps in terms of what we're adding upon the building blocks of what enable this flash fabric. So I mentioned mirroring. One of the challenges for enterprises to adopt flash in a more progressive or pervasive way is not being willing to take the risk of losing data and or uptime. So replication, mirroring, et cetera. This is a capability we delivered about a year ago. On top of that, we had to deliver the ability to begin to scale that, to cluster that, to share it in a way that you could actually have a pool of storage centralized and shared across multiple servers. So in this case, we've started to break, break apart through virtual volumes the ability to connect different devices with different servers, increasing our utilization and reducing the risk of over-provisioning. We need to continue to take that to the next level of scale where we can actually provide not only the shared pool, but the ability to actually aggregate and create a concatenated volume of shared flash. So today we're delivering on that vision with another step in the sequence, introducing the industry's first volume manager, clustering volume manager with device affinity. This is the HGST Veritant Space software. This allows us to, as I mentioned, take up to 16 PCI devices and aggregate those into a single volume or space. An example of that would be, in this case, a mirrored, a mirrored volume of 38 terabytes of the highest performing flash inside the server at that server level shared across multiple applications. Now let's take the other extreme and get to the most granular view. The software is intelligent enough to actually take those volumes in an aggregate single volume and actually break those into smaller volumes or spaces for specific application needs, putting the power of that choice in the hands of the data center environment. This allows us not only to share and pool and actually allocate that flash across applications, but it also, when combined with our share capability, allows us to begin to provide remote access at a level of scale of 128 servers architecturally determined and, and qualified today where you can actually have access. So the example is this. Any server that joins the volume or the fabric can have access to any of the flash on that fabric. This allows not only that flexibility, but it also allows for dynamic change. By adding a server to this fabric, we can actually do that dynamically. We also have that same flexibility on the PCIe device itself, adding that dynamically. Tremendous power and capability when you start to think about, again, Flash as a platform and delivering on the vision of Flash as a fabric. And this, this represents that 128 servers and the remote capability and access point. So where do we point this technology? Today we're pointed at very specific uh, shared storage environments, a tremendous opportunity for us to help and enable Oracle Rack as an example, where we can provide an all Flash volume, uh, transparent to the application, and by doing so, we can provide that level of performance up to five times the performance at half the cost in one particular example. In addition, we're focused on clustering technologies where you start to think about scale out. And by looking at many of these in terms of how we actually, actually uh, roll out the uh, replication capabilities, many of those clustered applications roll those out in dedicated pairs. 
So as I add two servers, I add two servers, I add two servers. Again, with the benefit of this volume or HGST varied in space, we can provide a single slave that provides that capability across those shared servers. The benefit being server consolidation, and in this case, about a 37% uh, benefit in terms of that consolidation. That's obviously cost savings, it's also space and utilization savings. And by being more intelligent in terms of our clustering capabilities, not only with the software, but with that device affinity I talked about, we can also drive savings in utilization and capacity of as much as 50%. So let me kind of bring this all together and bring it to life. I think one of the things that we stated up front is that Flash as a technology is changing data centers today. We also talked about how it's changing business models. So specifically LinkedIn, who's a, a very strong and, and great customer of ours, started with their own vision around Flash as a platform many years ago and tried to solve a particular pain point around performance and SLAs in the back office finance and accounting capabilities. They delivered on that and saw the benefits of Flash as large enough that they wanted to push that forward to the customer facing applications, their open source database world, and actually start to drive the unique advantages of Flash's performance and then the analytics. So LinkedIn has 250 million users today. There are 45 million uh, sites being viewed, 45 million uh, you know, LinkedIn profiles are viewed every day. In addition to that, they add two, two new users every second, and over half of their user base is outside the United States. That's scale. And they've been able to generate business returns, new product services, correlating and making introductions of folks by leveraging this technology and, and driving these types of business benefits, right? A 300% increase in performance, not just that performance increase, but by reducing latency, the user experience becomes more real time. And as I mentioned earlier, not only real time, but predictive. Because if you signed into LinkedIn and you're one of those other 3.5 million businesses that use the product, you also know that they say, you might know this person or you might be associated with that person. Those analytics come from the crunching and the leverage of that performance flash. So let me wrap here. We are very excited to have announced three specific new aspects to our vision. We've announced the extension of our Intel Joint Development Agreement. We've announced our entry into the NVMe space with our Ultrastar SN100. And we've announced the industry's first file and volume manager with device affinity. From there, you can also see, I think, as we mentioned earlier, our vision around not only being a market participant, but one that wants to help shape and lead the market. And our voice, we expect to continue to drive and deliver as we go forward. So thank you for the opportunity to share our vision around the Flash Platforms Group. At this point, I'm also extremely excited to announce some of the work uh, that we're doing in uh, the capacity side. And I want to introduce our Senior Vice President and General Manager of the Elastic Storage Platform Group, Dave Tang. Thanks, guys. 1.7 million bytes of data every minute of every hour of every day for every man, woman, and child on the planet. That's how fast the digital universe is growing right now. And that's a lot of data. And it's made up of a lot of things. It's made up of data that's newly created. And of course, not all of that data is valuable and useful enough for us to keep. It's also made up of data that is in transit, a streaming movie, for example. And it's also made up of data that's being replicated and certainly we can't justify saving copies of every single point of that. So how much data really is worth us saving? Well, studies have shown that within the digital universe, last year, the amount of data that was worth saving was 22% of the total digital universe. But as we look out over time, that's expected to increase. As we approach 2020, it's expected that 37% of the data being uh, generated within the digital universe will be worth saving. That's because digital scientists are finding ways to extract value for that data, which is requiring us to keep it and hold it and use it for longer periods of time. 
Now, the interesting thing is, if you take the trend in the growth of the overall digital universe, that is a 10x increase between 2013 and 2020, and you combine it with this trend of 22% of that digital universe being useful to 37% of it being useful, you get a growth of 17 times in useful data creation between last year and 2020. Now think about that, 17 times. Not many things grow 17 times in seven years. If we were to apply that to say the fuel efficiency of automobiles, in 2020, the average car would get 391 miles to the gallon. So that's a pretty impressive rate of, of progress. But what's really interesting about this trend is that if you look at analyst projections for the storage capacity that's going to be available in 2020, and compare that with the amount of useful and valuable data that's being created in 2020, only about 40% of that useful and valuable data has a home. And we see that white space as a tremendous opportunity for the storage industry and for ourselves. Now to understand what we need to do to capture that opportunity, we need to consider many other factors. Now we, we talked earlier about the cloud and how this is the crossover year that cloud data center workloads will surpass traditional data center workloads. Well, what's going on in the cloud? Well, for new applications, over 75% of the new applications in the cloud will be big data intensive. That suggests that more and more data will need to live in the cloud and be accessible in the cloud. Now, also looking at data that's coming from sensors and machine-generated data. That's data that's not coming from your typical transactional application and transactional server and being stored in those systems. This is data that's being ingested directly into the cloud. In fact, I'm doing that right now. So we need a place to put that in the cloud with characteristics that are completely different than what we've been accustomed to in the past. And in terms of handling the scalability and the manageability of these systems, an interesting point to note is that the amount of data that will be managed by each IT professional will grow eight times between 2013 and 2020. Now, to kind of put that in perspective, the amount of useful data that's being created, that's useful, not total digital universe, but useful data that's being created doubles every 21 months but the number of IT professionals may never double, at least within our lifetime. So that suggests that we need solutions that are more scalable and more easy to manage in order to handle this massive growth in data. And we really need to find a way to capture that because within the vast amounts of usable and uh, valuable data, there's value. And if you can't store it, you can't get to it, we can't extract that value. And that's a lost opportunity. Businesses can't be more productive or profitable without that data. They'll be challenged to adapt to the changes in the market. And they'll have a really hard time trying to predict the future. So what we need is a solution that addresses that. And the trouble is that in today's world, the options have not been sufficient. We have traditional storage solutions that are built for performance but they're nearly not built for scale. And then we have solutions that are built for capacity and cost, such as tape, but they're not built for accessibility. You can't really get to that data fast enough to make use of it as a business. So that chasm that sits between those two alternatives today represents the opportunity that lies right in front of us. Now, we need solutions that address this opportunity that are driven by massive amounts of data growth as well as the predominance of the cloud. We need solutions that can store data that's born in the cloud, ingested into the cloud, or migrated into the cloud, and that's held for long-term data access. If we can address the scalability, accessibility, and affordability needs of this um, opportunity, then we can deliver to an underserved market that wants to store all of the useful data that's being created. And that's exactly what HGST is doing to address 
an emerging opportunity in an area of active archive. Now to do this, we're taking a complete bottoms up approach, clean slate approach to designing the solution. Traditionally, to design a storage system, you would take commercially available disk drives and commercially available enclosures, and you'd integrate them together. And the trouble with that is that the value of that solution is equal to the sum of the parts. But by leveraging our knowledge and expertise of the underlying storage devices, we can extract a lot more value, um, not only in terms of cost per capacity, but in uh, total cost of ownership that's required to serve this marketplace. So the first thing we start with is optimized hard drives. You heard from Mike earlier a lot about our helium drives and that the power put footprint of those drives is 40 to 50% lower per terabyte than alternative drives. That allows us to put a lot more devices within a footprint of a rack. And uh, our rack densities are high and there are, are, are um, companies working on high density racks, but they're unable to serve the needs of an active archive system because they have to power down two thirds, three quarters of those drives at a time. They can't have all those drives operating because they don't have uh, the, the helium drives to, uh, to reduce the power footprint. So you can't have the densities required without the use of helium drives. And secondly, understanding the mechanical requirements of mounting drives, we can tune our enclosures specifically for our drive designs. And this allows us to pack more devices, of course, into an enclosure as well as get more out of those individual devices because through device affinity, that is our expertise in, in understanding the underlying technologies, we can draw more out of the drives to drive significantly higher value than the sum of the parts in the area of capacity and performance. And then finally, because we need high scalability and manageability, we provide a scale-out software solution that provides unsurpassed scalability into the exabyte range with ease of management. So what we've created is an active archive platform that serves as a building block for a new age of solutions to handle the massive growth in data. So this building block can be used to create massively scale store, uh, scalable storage systems. In fact, we can store over 10 petabytes of storage in a single rack. That's probably worth repeating, 10 petabytes, that's 10 million gigabytes of data in a single rack. And that's a lot of data. That's 400,000 Blu-ray movies. You might think, who would ever want to store that? Well, if we go back to the rate at which useful and valuable data is being created, there's 10 petabytes of that being created about every four minutes. So the need for these scale, uh, scalable systems is here now. And in terms of our ability to provide uh, higher TCO value to our customers, we can create these solutions with five times uh, less floor space consumption. So what it takes them to do in five racks, we can do in one. And we can also do it at one fifth of the power consumption. So in order to, to power 10 terabytes of our solution versus their solution, we save enough energy to power four homes. So what we aim to do with this new class of solutions is to provide the lowest TCO available in the marketplace. That is the lowest acquisition cost per petabyte, the lowest power consumption per petabyte, the lowest cooling cost within the data center per petabyte. And for new data centers where they're we're wiring the power infrastructure, we can help eliminate the cost by reducing the total requirement of power on a per rack basis. And then of course, the highest uh, density that we provide also provides more efficient use of floor space within the data center. And then the massive scalability and ease of management uh, enable the storage of, of all useful data without exponential growth in, in management costs. And then of course, fast access to, to data is required in order to make use of it. And we're embracing open APIs and standard interfaces in order to connect to existing and future systems. So what we've done with this Active Archive solution is we've filled the void that's uh, existed with traditional systems and archive systems 
And by designing these solutions uh, to be scalable and accessible and affordable, we can meet the needs of, of the cloud systems with highly scalable environments uh, that our partners and our customers uh, can use to transform their businesses. Now to deliver this uh, to the market in an accelerated fashion, we're highlighting two partnerships that we've formed. One is with a company called Ampladata, who has object storage software that provides scalability into the exabyte level. The second relationship is with a company called Avere Systems that provides a gateway solution. This enables applications that typically use a file storage protocol to enjoy the benefits of mass scalability of object storage solutions. So this would be typical in enterprise environments that are looking to enjoy private cloud or hybrid cloud implementations. Now both of these partnerships, in addition to the joint development agreements that we have in place and commercial relationships that we have, have also received investments from our parent company, Western Digital Corporation, so we have very close relationships with them. So this is a truly exciting time in the data center storage uh, business and a very exciting time for us at HCST. Over the past five decades, our partners and customers have trusted us with innovations in technology, products, and solutions. And they count on us to deliver those solutions so that they can evolve and transform their businesses. Let's hear what some of them have to say. HTST storage has been very good for us. We store our clean energy project data on HGST disks. They are reliable. They have allowed us not to worry too much about our data arrays and concentrate on the science. By partnering with HGST, we've been able to shore up the supply chain and provide a steady flow of product for our deployments. And have also been able to have a deep relationship with the technical staff and also access to new products early in the life cycle. We partner with HGST to help our business goals of offering the highest performance, the most leading edge technology, fastest time to market, and best cost performance for our storage solutions, and HGST is a great partner for us. Okay. I think you'll agree with what you've heard today that HGST is no longer your father's disk drive company with groundbreaking innovations in our hard drive business, plus what Gus and Dave talked about in our flash platforms group and our elastic storage group, HGST is well positioned to drive the data center transformation of the future. So with that, I think we'll open the floor for questions. Okay, uh, thank you, Mike, Gus, Dave, and Steve. I just wanted to remind everybody that we'll be fielding questions both from the room here as well as online. We've got Lisa here with the microphone. If you've got a question, we do need to speak into the microphone. Uh, for those of you that are submitting questions online, and also you can do that here as well in the room, uh, those questions will be fed up through the tablets here. Uh, so be fed up directly to uh, our speakers to answer. And just to remind you, the uh, information to text us is 22333 with the keyword HGST in the body followed by the question. Um, you can also submit questions via pollev.com slash HGST. I just want to stress that when you are texting in questions, you need to put HGST as the keyword followed by your question in the body, otherwise we will not receive them. Okay, thank you. We have, um, oh, I'm sorry, we have about 15 to 20 minutes to take some questions. Okay, great. Uh, so my name is David Floyer uh, from Wikibon, and uh, congratulations on a really uh, strategic announcement today. I've got one very detailed question. Uh, hybrid SSDs, or hi sorry, hybrid SSD and HDDs have been played up by uh, Seagate a lot. Could you comment on your strategy in that area? All right, let, let me start it, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dave and Gus to uh, add some comments. So our view is we see the benefit of combining 
NAND-based technology with HED-based technology. But in our view, that's best done at a level higher than the, the device itself. So when you look at the solutions we're delivering, both in the flat, Flash Platforms group, but also in Elastic Storage, uh, we see that as a better way to, to conceive of combining those benefits. Right. Gus, you have a comment? I, I just, one quick one is that the, the canvas that you think about maybe when you start to actually architect the solution, uh, we have pieces today that allow us to think about the problem in a completely different way. So as far up the stack we can get around that really provides a level of architectural freedom for our development team in a way to come at it differently. Nothing, nothing other than that. Yeah, from the perspective of highly scalable solutions, uh, when you're looking at systems at scale, um, you have uh, um, the, the opportunity to solve them in a number of ways. You don't need to solve them at the elemental level. You can solve them uh, with larger resources or larger pieces, in this case of flash and, and disk. That requires software expertise, of course, as the connective tissue to make them work efficiently. But as long as uh, you have that, that capability, or you've committed to developing that capability, you don't re really need um, the, the, the atomic uh, blending of, of flash and disk. Okay, let me take one from the web here. So one question um, to me is, we heard, that we heard you address the move up the stack to add more value. What does that mean for HGST and our customers? Uh, let me comment on that. I think our view is, is as our customers' strategies evolve, as they shift their focus of investment, this brings an opportunity with their strategic direction combined with what's happening in the ecosystem for us to partner in a different way. So everything you heard from us today are things we're actively working with our best storage system uh, and server OEM customers, as well as with our cloud service provider customers. So we're just enabling uh, with different building blocks as we go forward. So we see it as very compatible with our existing go-to-market model, and we're working in collaborations, uh, collaborations with our traditional customers. If I could just add that. So we cater to two uh, general um, segments of the market. One is OEM system companies, the other one is cloud service providers. Cloud service providers really want to focus on developing new services to, um, to attract and retain their customers. They don't really want to focus on uh, the, the development of, of specific hardware building blocks um, and, um, and infrastructure within the data center. And then for system OEMs, they're focusing as well on their more profitable areas of business in services and software and not necessarily looking to continue uh, to focus investments in the area of, of hardware platform building blocks. So um, uh, we're, we're working very closely so that everyone can elevate their role in the ecosystem. Okay. Um, uh, my question was, could you be more specific from technical point of view on your uh, partnership with Intel? You want to take that one? Yeah, I'll start. I think, the, so a couple of things. We, we have a partnership today that allows, uh, as I mentioned at a higher level, HGST brings the benefits of the storage expertise and Intel brings the benefits of the NAND expertise. And so uh, without going into a lot of detail, what we have is very uh, clear investment areas where we have joint development around both of those things with each party bringing the best of their elements, but then aggregating that together with a dedicated team of people that are committed to the partnership and have been through multiple generations of product. Um, if you want to go into a little bit more detail, we might be able to do that offline, but that's, that's how I would describe that partnership today. Yeah, let me just comment a little bit. This, this uh, partnership has been going since 2008. Uh, we couldn't be happier after a few years of uh, making it, uh, sort of oiling the wheels, if you will, and how it's working. Uh, we work very well together. It's a very integrated team. Uh, we're now into uh, our fourth generation of product. Uh, and that development process works extremely well, and we really do, as Gus says, uh, leverage the benefits and knowledge and best capabilities of both companies. So we're very happy with it. Okay, why don't we take Gus the question from the web? This one here? Yes. Okay, so one of the questions from the web was uh, the discussion around device affinity, and the question was around, isn't that just another name for proprietary software? Yeah. Um, so I read it as bluntly as it was asked. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the second part of the question was around, is it unique to just HGST's devices or not? So I, I would say this, uh, device affinity has multiple dimensions to it. Um, if it's something that can advantage in a, in a unique opportunity for us, as I described with tight integration between HGST hardware and software, yes, you could view that as proprietary, but it's those insights and those investments 
that, that we actually enable and deliver that leadership advantage. And I mentioned that in terms of double the performance and, and double the endurance as an example. However, we're also committed to provide those capabilities to the marketplace. And we do that today with, with certain parts of our own device affinity. As we've learned and advantaged our own technology and, and product solutions, we've also taken some of those out to our partners, whether again that's on the OEM side, server or storage. And we're also contributing to the standards groups. So you're going to see it in probably three dimensions. One, you will see advantages that HGST delivers on our own products and uniquely does that. Two, you'll see us open up those capabilities and device affinity, those insights to our strategic partners. And third, you're also going to see us contribute to just general standards where this can be leveraged not only on our products, but on third-party products as well. Okay, one more from the web. Steve, you want to take the question? Sure. Uh, the question is, can you provide an update on what uh, Western Digital is seeing related to current PC and capacity enterprise demand trends? Uh, a few comments to make in that regard. First thing is, is that relative to, from an overall demand perspective, the quarter um, uh, is playing out pretty much the way that we had expected it to play out um, when we had our uh, earnings conference call uh, a few weeks back. Um, two notable things which this question touches on. The first thing is, um, which has been an encouraging sign uh, building over the last uh, couple of quarters is we continue to see the demand environment in the PC market or in the client space um, stabilize. Uh, we've gone through several quarters of uh, significant declines in volume, um, you know, going back historically here, but we continue to see the PC market stabilize, um, which is encouraging from our perspective. Uh, the second thing is, is that relative to the capacity enterprise market, um, we continue to see uh, an improving demand environment uh, as our customers um, are accelerating deployments as we move through not only this quarter but the back half of the year. Um, and so those are two, uh, two um, positive trends that we're seeing um, that we anticipated uh, at our prior uh, earnings call. Okay, great. Question. Okay. Yeah, hi, Mark Peters, ESG. Um, so, nice, succinct, lots of content. Well done from that perspective. <laughs> this could have dragged on all day, and I don't mean that badly, but many other vendors would, so good job. Um, second question, could you give a little more information um, on Ampler Data and Avere, the nature of the relationship, the extent, and where you expect that to go? Because those, to me, look small today, but potentially significant. Dave, you want to take that one? Sure. Well, um, of course, we can't commit a comment on, on the specifics of the, the partnerships, but um, I can say that uh, both of them include elements of, of joint development activities where both companies are contributing uh, intellectual property and resources. They both include elements of a commercial relationship with either uh, resale or licensing of technologies between the companies. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, the investment from Western Digital Co uh, Corporation in, in both of them. Okay. All right, Dave, want to take this one as well, two in a row? Um, sure. So there is a question on uh, different use cases for uh, the 10 terabyte drive versus the 8 terabyte drive. So that's a great question. So the, 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 there are um, technology enhancements, uh, and then there are foundational technologies that could be um, uh, innovated and integrated into our products. So, Something on the order of a, a faster interface uh, would be um, an enhancement, but something like SMR, which is what really enables the, the bump to 10 terabytes over the 8 terabyte drive, uh, should be thought of as, as more of a, a foundational technology innovation. And the reason is that um, the shingled magnetic recording, as the name suggests, um, is an overlapping of tracks on top of one another, and in the same fashion, the roof of a, of a house needs to be shingled in a certain order. Um, it, it, the writing to the zones within shingled magnetic recording drives needs to be done in, in a sequential fashion. 
So uh, what the result of that is that they are mm -hmm. ideal for environments where the data being written to them is past the create and modify phase and is really intended to be written and retained for long periods of time. So there, there's, no, there's no difference in the read performance, but there are considerations when writing the data because if you continually rewrite the data, similar to having to change a shingle at the lower part of a roof, you've got to go back and uh, re-shingle or re rewrite on, on top of that to maintain the, uh, the, the order uh, and structure of the shingles. Okay. Okay, now we have uh, SMR, but what's about uh, HAMR? How far away we are from heat-assisted magnetic recording now? Okay, the question is how far away from hammer technology are we? I think that's an area where we continue to invest and we expect at some time in the future that it will be, we will realize the promise of hammer. Uh, we have to evaluate a number of factors. One is obviously the technical feasibility of it, but also the economic cost of implementing it. So our view would be it's still going to be out in the future, 2017 and beyond. It's something we anticipate will enter the ecosystem at some point. Uh, and to take uh, a little bit of a cue from a question from the web and just extend on it, um, it's absolutely compatible with our helium technology. So those two, um, the technology advantage of those two technology building blocks are totally complementary. So all the benefits we get in flying in helium from a mechanical perspective will apply directly to the deployment of hammer. So as we continue to build aerial density technology, Helium's a fundamental uh, foundational piece of technology as Dave talked about. SMR is also that. Hammer's the next one of those. So those things all can combine in ways that allow us to continue to drive aerial density forward uh, out into the distant future. So these are all things our research team continues to work on to enable a roadmap uh, into the future. Yeah, hi, John Ridding with IDC. Great presentation as well. And uh, my question is on the uh, Helio Seal hard drives. It was about a year ago, maybe a little more than a year ago, you announced the Helio Seal technology and the first six terabyte helium filled drive. And at the time you announced that, some of your customers were a little cautious about it, maybe some were even skeptical and uh, concerned about adopting that technology. They were concerned about uh, maybe the long-term reliability of the drives, uh, availability, single sourcing, maybe even cost. Uh, maybe you could comment on uh, how you've addressed those questions yeah. over the past year and maybe give us a state of the state where your customers are at today with that platform. Yeah, sure, great question, thanks. Um, so I think first, our plans with the six terabyte version sort of realized or contemplated what, what you just asked in the question. We needed to launch that product with frankly a lower volume expectation than we would with a traditional product line. So we did not expect to ship millions of those in the first generation. We wanted to prove out um, the platform itself, both from a manufacturability and reliability in the field standpoint. We now have hundreds of thousands of drives that are deployed in the field, as I said in my presentation, to dozens of customers. Uh, we've had no issues on either front. In fact, the reliability performance of that platform meets or exceeds uh, are in air based products. So that we're very comfortable with, we've proven out. The value proposition was the other one that people weren't sure. Was it gonna be realized as we deployed into the field? Um, that was complicated in a number of ways for us because we were selling a different value proposition. It was not strictly the age old cost per terabyte, next generation product, just do the math and you know the price of that product. We actually sell that product at a rather significant premium. And we sell it underneath, underneath that premium because we can garner better total cost, total cost of ownership deployed in the data center. That also, as you heard in some of the videos, is being realized by our customers. So we have to continue to evolve that technology platform. We have to continue to cost reduce it as we get prepared to drive into higher volumes and making it our mainstream platform. Our development teams are doing a great job of doing that. So we, what we see as we go into the eight terabyte and beyond is the ability to continue to drive the value proposition and sustain it. So those, value, those, uh, those benefits are realized by our customers. Uh, and we see ourselves in a better position to ramp much higher volume and continue to cost reduce the basic platform technology. So uh, we're very happy with the progress of it. I think by demonstration of us moving our entire capacity enterprise portfolio to that going forward, uh, that would suggest the confidence we have in the platform and the market's uh, willingness to accept it. OK, 
Okay, we have one more from the web here. So Dave, you want to grab this one here? Okay, there's a question about uh, how we're going to address the shortage in storage capacity projected um, uh, out in 2020. This is the 40% the uh, capability that I mentioned that the, that the projection for storage capacity shipped. Well, so the, um, the, the projections are typically based on, on available technologies at the time that, the, that research is done. So what we're looking to do is to create a new category of storage that has the ability of dressing that, that white space, that green field opportunity um, where, um, where there's, there's a potential for, for um, demand elasticity with respect to the cost per petabyte. So that, that's our goal is to fundamentally change the total cost of ownership per petabyte so that um, the, the market uh, will store that data that currently is not being stored. So one other quick one, if I can, Mike asked me to address uh, that came from the web. It was a question around uh, NAND supply and whether we have a concern around uh, our NAND supply having referenced Intel and Toshiba. The short answer is no. Um, we enjoy several strategic relationships with different NAND providers, as mentioned uh, quite a bit with the uh, Intel relationship, not only on supply but on the, uh, the deep technical and uh, business relationship between the companies. But we also mentioned Toshiba and I, I mentioned briefly Micron. So I think our strategy there um, has given us uh, high confidence around supply and probably more importantly, a uh, tremendous choice and opportunity to pick best in class as we go forward on other product and platform choices we make. Yeah, I've got a question about the, uh, the Active Archive platform. Um, can you talk a little bit about the components that are in that system? I mean, you guys have made a lot of acquisitions lately. I know this is a capa capacity-centric box, but can you tell, tell us a little bit about some of the technology that's in that box? Well, the, we have um, uh, systems out in the, in the 4A for you to take a look at. We'll be disclosing more details about what's exactly inside the box and how we, how we boost the capacity uh, and value uh, the way that we do um, early, early in, uh, in 2015. So at, at the moment, uh, what we talked about today was, is um, the extent of our disclosure. Good okay. morning. Les Tokar with the SSD Review. Uh, excellent uh, program, folks. A couple questions, if I can, looking a little more closely at the NVMe products that you're bringing forward. Can we speak a little more uh, uh, specifically with respect to the performance of the new drives? Uh, and as well, I guess the question may have been already answered. You chose to go with Toshiba NAND flash memory uh, with that family. Is there a, uh, any specific reason you didn't go with the Intel there? Yeah, so two, two parts to the question. I guess the first one is uh, some specifics around the performance of those NVMe products in the second round, the choice of uh, the NAND technology. So in reverse order, the, the, the selection we made on the, the NAND technology was really focused on, for this particular platform, trying to drive the highest levels of performance and certain power thresholds and budgets that, that work very well for us uh, in this particular product. And especially when you look at trying to optimize the highest levels of performance, any advantage you can get on, on the power utilization is a huge, huge one. So we, we made the selection uh, uh, in part based on that. Um, on the detail and the specifics of the performance, we're not announcing any more detail today around it. Um, we did speak to the capacity points. Um, we do believe that we've got industry-leading performance on, particularly on mixed read-write workloads. Um, so as we get closer to the, uh, the detailed launch, we'll have some specifics on that performance to share with you. Yeah. Dave, you want to? Hi, uh, Rich Castagna, Tech Target. So as, as, as we've seen the capacities of the hard disk drives grow from you know, 6, 8, 10, we also see the applications, the intended applications change to accommodate the, the larger capacities and the lower performances. Is there a practical limit to, to where we can go with hard disk capacity? You want to try that one, Dave? I'll, I'll start, maybe you can limit. fill in. So, so the question is, is there a practical limit? How much capacity we put on a single spindle? I think. From our standpoint, there are challenges. There's an access density challenge in the industry, but that just presents itself as an opportunity for us to solve, right? So when you look at the value add we can deploy on top of the devices themselves, we have that kind of understanding, and we can deploy layers of technology through device affinity as well as other value added software uh, to handle that problem. So it's something that we see as a challenge for the broader uh, infrastructure and ecosystem, uh, but as we bring these new uh, technologies to market. We want to help enable the consumption of those technologies. So that's why you see us begin to innovate uh, and invest in different areas. So rather than sit back and say, here's a 10 terabyte drive, let's see what the industry is going to do and when they can actually use it, we're actually going to develop 
the solutions to help the industry consume it. Dave, you want to? Yeah, and I, I think a couple different perspectives on that. One is at the device level, um, are there limits to, to the capacity that you want to develop? And, and with the foundational technologies that we have, in, in particular with the helium technology, I think uh, we have the ability to extend those capacities in a more reliable way than, um, than others in the industry. From a system perspective, uh, Mike mentioned the access density question. Well, we actually see that uh, as something that's shifting in the marketplace because of the nature of data and the nature of the, the long-term use of data. So it used to be that, that storage systems were really used as primary storage and there was a high I.O. density. But if you think of, of the way data is being used now and, and it's retaining data for longer and longer periods of time, data that's not really changing, the I.O. density is actually going down, which favors these high capacity per device um, elements. So, so the use cases are changing as well. And then the other reason why you may not want a high capacity device in a large system is recovery times. Um, if you think about RAID and, and the rebuild time of, of a RAID set if a device fails, um, beyond four terabytes can be uh, relatively painful for, for, for rebuilding. But with the, uh, the adoption of erasure coding, such as the technology that um, Amplidata has, has developed, and in particular, highly dispersed um, uh, erasure coding systems, the recovery, uh, pr protection and recovery of the data is done in, in a lot uh, more seamless and, and faster fashion. So I, I, in short, the, the limitations are, are being either addressed or um, are dissolving because of market demands. Okay. Hi, <clears throat> Tim Stammers, 451 Research. So I have two questions which are actually quite separate. The first one is, uh, are you, do you think it's likely you'll ever make bigger disk drives or return to five, six inch diameter drives to suit that ac low access density? <laughs> access density? And the other one is, could, we, could you just get a little bit more comment on the fact that you are on the pros and cons of not having your own NAND supply and having to rely on three other suppliers? I'm sure it has advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, so, so let me take the second part of the question first. Um, so from our perspective, our ability to uh, work with the best NAND vendors in the industry gives us uh, some techno technological advantages. I think one of the things we talked about is our choice to select Toshiba uh, and our MVME product. And what we're really looking at is all, uh, all of the NAND vendors are not created equal at each uh, node point. So what we're looking for is to optimize with the best technology partner uh, that matches best with what we're trying to deliver at the product, uh, product level. So that's something uh, we are working closely with uh, three of the big major um, NAND manufacturers. We have very good relationships with them, both commercially as well as technically. That's something we continue to evolve, but that's an area we continue to look at and evaluate over the course of time. But I think we see, we're very comfortable with where we sit right now uh, with the ability to enable the products that we have on our roadmap for the next one to two years. Obviously, that's an evolving area, MVME in general, not only with NAND, but future, future MVME technologies. Uh, and we continue to study that uh, very closely. Bigger discs. Bigger discs. Well, at this point, I think obviously we're going to be looking at technologies to enable use cases. Uh, at this point, we have no plans to do that, but we will continue to look at what are the right building blocks to enable these use cases over the course of time. So I think our view is we need to invest into the future. We need to invest to enable uh, the trends that we see happening primarily in cloud data centers. Uh, so we'll continue to evaluate what, what the right building blocks are. You want to get this one down? There's a question about active archive and uh, what we mean by active archive. And does that mean we're processing data uh, within the active archive system? So active archive is actually a term that, that's been around in the industry. And it, it really simply means that the storage of data that is in the, the retention phase of its, of its life cycle, uh, but wanting to have access to it in, on, a, on an on-demand rapid basis. So you don't want to have to suffer the time that it takes to, um, to load a tape library, for example. Um, so our definition of active archive is a particular use case within the broader spectrum of what's been called cold storage in that it's not storing hot data, data that, that, uh, that uh, for example, uh, PCIe flash 
devices would be more suited for. We're, we're looking to create the, a new tier uh, of storage. And if you think of um, the, the power of data and extracting the value of, of data and the infrastructure that's, that's needed to do that, um, if data is the, the currency of the, the new economy, we're, we're trying to round out the options for um, providing um, a, a data supply chain, if you will, for companies so that they can transform, refine, and extract value from that data. Um, David Floyer from Wikibon again. Um, I'd like to ask a strategic question, if I may. 20 years ago, EMC started on a path to creating the SAM uh, marketplace and were highly successful in adding value to uh, Seagate technology. Um, with your flash, flash fabric, you're obviously betting that server SAN, uh, SANs in the server are, are, are the new uh, model. What else do you believe you need uh, to become the uh, replacement of EMC in the storage market? <laughs> Well, let let well, me start with that, and you can maybe go. So, so I think our ambition, uh, that would be a little broader than our ambition, yeah. is to replace EMC. I think we really see ourselves um, as complementing the existing infrastructure providers. We see a lot of ways architecturally to deploy flash into the data center infrastructure. What Gus talked about is a specific thrust that we have uh, to do that. Uh, but we will be very broad in our view of how NAND and MVM based technology plays into the data center. So at this point, I think you'll see us working with those guys and enable those guys more than we're trying to create a shift to a direct flash fabric uh, that will disrupt our customers. Yeah, and I think, I think the point that this has been made a couple of times is a really important one, is that our, our vision around what the market wants is driven directly from the market back. So what we're building in terms of capabilities, products or building blocks here are things that we will and do provide to our current partners and will going forward. So there'll be mix and match opportunities for us to take these technologies to market through those partners. There'll be opportunities for us if, if uh, folks see an advantage around either time to market or differentiation that they can then uh, exploit in their own product sets and we're more than happy to do that. So our vision right now is to you know step forward, uh, provide the answer to some of these opportunities and take the building blocks that we have and make those available through any of these routes to market. And it's been, uh, it's been a tenant of our strategy to do that. Okay, um, if we can, we've got a lot of questions that are coming in online. So if we could take maybe three uh, final questions from online and then we'll come back to the room for one final question. There's only two on here. I, there's, I think there's a lot Yeah, well we need some, more, we need some more on the feed. So let me take the one on, uh, there's a question on SMR uh, and uh, well, I'll read it. We've heard that SMR performance is very bad and therefore SMR drives can only be used in a few applications. I don't think we're trying to uh, make the point that SMR is bad. What we are making the point is, is there's a technology lead time to deploy this into the broader infrastructure and make it usable. So one of the things we're doing is we're saying the earlier versions of SMR, uh, which our host managed, uh, we can make those uh, valuable in the marketplace through a higher value solution. As time goes on, obviously SMR technology will evolve and become more capable uh, and it will see itself into more sort of traditional use cases. The problem we're trying to sur solve here is an age-old problem in the hard drive industry. We announce things, whether it be a new interface speed or a new technology or a new uh, way to format a disk drive, 4K being an example, and the marketplace takes two, three, five years to actually adopt it. Uh, what we're trying to do is accelerate the adoption of the new technology so we can deliver value to the market in an accelerated way. Gus, you want to take that one? Yeah, so one just came in from the web. Uh, please review the components of the flash fabric. Um, so yeah, so I, I think the building blocks going back to, to how we stage this step at a time is the ability to, number one, take best-in-class devices providing application acceleration, whether at the storage side, optimizing inside of the network with NAS devices or even up into the server. So at all layers of the data center, we, we need to make sure that we've got best in class device. A second building block of that is the device affinity, the capability of whether it's unique to HGST or things that we provide and are open to the general market, providing to provide more intelligence around that device, that device affinity. And then a third building block is the opportunity to provide the advanced software capabilities where you can start to build that shared platform with high availability through mirroring and replication, 
the ability to actually scale through clustering capabilities, and ultimately to provide a shared pool of storage and a shared volume at an aggregate level, or as I mentioned, at a more deep granular level allocated to every single server or application at your choice. Those building blocks now all together really start to put the power of choice in the hands of the data center to start thinking about flash in a way well beyond a particular single application or, or a single device. And so those would be the elements that, that added together uh, are key building blocks to a flash fabric. Okay. Um, Judy, here's a question for you. Will the slides be made available on your website? You want to answer that? Yes, yes, we will. So I think the question is yes, they will be available. Yes. So all the assets will yes. be available. The, the, live, uh, the archive finished. of the live stream will be available. Okay. All right. There's a question here. What's your plans for two and a half inch hard drives? So today we've obviously focused on our plans and our investment towards the data center infrastructure. Uh, HGST continues to be a volume provider of two and a half inch drives. We continue uh, to develop drives to service that market need. Obviously, given the broader trends uh, in the environment, we see less opportunity to differentiate within that segment. So uh, we have shifted some of our R&D focus to the opportunities we see in the data center, which we've articulated today. But you'll see us continue to pr participate in a two and a half inch uh, market for a long time to come. Yeah, and one thing just to add on that is that we, um, we through HGST, continue to be a full service provider of two and a half inch um, small form factor performance drives, either through a 10K or a 15K uh, product, product offering. Yeah, I was talking about mobile, but yes, yeah, yes, exactly. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good point. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> No, nope, that's it. I don't think I need that. Okay, well, thank you everyone. Thank you for attending today's um, HGST Press and Industry Analyst Briefing. Um, I, with that, we can conclude the live stream. And for those of you that are in the room, you can stay here.